Great. So we're on Facebook Live, so maybe we should get started because we just have the hour. And um, so welcome, everyone. And let me just resume our recording, just letting you know that our event today is going to be recorded. All right. So welcome, everyone. We are so glad to host this book series event. This is the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora. My name is Lori Lambert. I'm the secretary for OSWAD. And we're really happy today to have Professor Katarina Gonzalez Seligman. We're excited to be discussing Katarina's new book, Writing the Caribbean in Magazine Time, which is recently published by Rutgers University Press. So today we're also joined by Professor Ana Lucia Araujo, who's a professor at the Department of History at Howard University. She's also a member of Oswald's executive board and part of our social media committee. And so she's helping us today with the Q&A. Uh, before I introduce Katharina, I wanna draw your attention to two events that Oswald has coming up. The first is our virtual symposium, Rising for Survival, which will be live streamed from November 4th to 6th. And I'll drop the link in the chat. Let me do that right now. So you can see uh, the information on our program and also how to register. It's a great program. Um, there's quite a few Caribbeanist folks presenting on there. Uh, we'll have Andrea Allen, Nicole Burrows, Michael Gomez, Aaron Kumgisha, Brian Meeks, Alyssa Trotz, uh, Ronaldo Walcott, among other esteemed speakers. So we really hope that you'll jo join us for that virtual symposium. The second event is December 2nd, 2021. Um, it's a, another book series event with Yesenia Baragan, and she'll be talking about her book, Freedoms, Captives, Slavery, and Gradual Emancipation on the Colombian Black Pacific, and that's an event that's organized by Ana Lucia. That's for 5 p.m. on Thursday, December 2nd, so mark your calendars, and we'll also have more information about that on Oswald's social media channels. We hope that you're following us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. The handle is at Oswald Diaspora. So uh, I'm gonna introduce Katarina now. Katarina Gonzalez Siegelman is a writer, literary translator and scholar of decolonial literature, history and social theory, especially of the Caribbean. Writing the Caribbean in Magazine Time is their first book and their essays on literary magazines, literary infrastructure and Caribbean textual and intellectual circulation also appear in MLN, Small Acts, South Atlantic Quarterly, The Global South, The Journal of Latin American Cultural Studies and INTI. Katharina holds a PhD in comparative literature from Brown University and is currently an associate professor at the University of Connecticut in the Department of Literatures, Cultures and Languages and El Instituto, Institute of Latina, Latino, Caribbean and Latin American Studies. So congratulations, uh, Katharina, both on this new position at the University of Connecticut and on the publication of your book. And we're going to give you the first word to introduce the book. Before I ask you some questions, there will be time for audience questions. And so I encourage everyone who's listening, as you think of your questions, you can place them in the Q&A. And once we get to the discussion period, you could also raise your hand and we can actually um, unmute your audio and you can ask Katharina your question directly, or you can also place questions in the chat. So um, welcome Katharina and let's hear uh, your introduction of your book. Thank you so much, Lori and uh, Ana Lucia and everyone who has participated in this event. It's really an extraordinary honor to get to talk about my work in the context of an Oswald forum. Um, I've only had the pleasure of one Oswald conference so far, but it was one of the best that I had attended and I have such high esteem and regard for the organization and the work of people associated with it. And um, so 
All right, I don't want to take too long so that we can get into conversation, but I'm going to try to respond to that challenge of respond of sort of very briefly introducing the book. Um, so what I think I'll so I'm going to start by giving you this sort of like the obvious thing in the back of the book, um, this this blurb, and then step back from it to talk about like how one gets to such a thing and and what are the kind of vectors that got me to the place of this book. So the blurb for the book says, this book demonstrates the material, political, and aesthetic dimensions of pan-Caribbean literary discourse in magazine texts by Suzanne and Emma Césaire, Nicolas Guillen, José de Samalima, Alejo Carpentier, George Lamming, Derek Walcott, and their contemporaries. Thus far, the canonical centrality of literary magazines to Caribbean literature, politics, and social theory have been obscured. Up against the global book industry, Caribbean literary magazines have waged a guerrilla pursuit for the terms of Caribbean representation. So I think there's a lot going on in my blurb and I won't give you my own critiques of, of my blurb. We, we can be so self-critical as academics. I think all of us have like a thousand self-critiques but I certainly do if we don't all. Um, but I want to talk about sort of what are the two vectors that get me to the place to challenge the, the, you know, the lack of centrality of periodicals to the way that uh, Caribbean literary and in broad terms intellectual history has been situated and to suggest that Caribbean literary magazines have waged something like a guerrilla pursuit for the terms of Caribbean representation. So I think um, and I'd be happy to talk more about the process. I have a lot of process and method thoughts, but the sort of the two kind of conceptual vectors that get me to that place in this book or that to sort of present that argument are one, an interest in how pan-Caribbean discourse has worked, right? This is a sort of the thing that I first came to and magazines started out as sort of sources for that question, like what, you know, what is the history of pan-Caribbean discourse? What is the role of, um, what are the role of literary works that have contributed to it? What has been the kind of extra literary, social and political function of that discourse? Um, you know, what are the racial and gendered politics of this discourse? And then also, um, when, I, so when I turned to magazines to sources, then I had so many questions about how these magazines were functioning as sources. And when I put the questions about the magazines and the questions about pan-Caribbean um, pan Caribbean discourse together, I arrived at these two ideas that are kind of anchoring in my book, one of which is the idea of location writing as a sort of way of thinking about what pan-Caribbean discourse is. And that idea kind of organizes a lot of the book. And then I also thought maybe I should you know, build on some language that already existed in relation to literary and cultural infrastructure um, to situate in very material terms what the significance of sort of people coming together in the Caribbean in a colonial or, ne or neo-colonial context and putting, um, you know, and publishing a magazine and what are the kinds of infrastructures that they are uh, connected to and what are and, and to what extent is that infrastructural work sort of serving to replace work that would be there if um, the context were not a neo-colonial context or a colonial context. So just sort of very, very brief to give you like a brief insight on how I kind of quickly, I'm gonna, if, if permit me to read about a paragraph on location writing and about a paragraph on literary infrastructure from the intro as a kind of sneak preview. Thank you, Lori, for the, <laughs> for the permission and the thumbs up. All right, so this is on page eight of my intro. As I chart designations of the Caribbean inside and outside of magazines, I work through a foundational premise of, of decolonial studies rooted in Latin America, the Caribbean, and the borders of US empire, that geographic and social locations are inherently embedded in the production of knowledge. Right? To an Oswald group, this is, not, this is not new, but sometimes we still need to say these things. All right. This premise also proceeds from the theoretical reflections by Emma Césaire and George Lamming that I engage in this book. 
Césaire implies the centrality of location to knowledge production when he offers a practice of poetry as the producer of contextual knowledge left out of scientific empiricism in his monumental essay, Poésie et Connaissance. And George Lamming more explicitly suggests that the colonial structure of the Antilles locates vision in the pleasures of exile. I won't read the whole paragraph actually. It's really, I really just want like a kind of to throw out a sort of snippet. <laughs> And then when I talk about literary infrastructure, I'll cut to this page on page 14 from the section literary infrastructure and location writing. Throughout the Caribbean region during at least the first half of the 20th century, writers most often sought literary infrastructure abroad to publish books. That is if they could, as available infrastructures for bookmaking at home were highly limited. By literary infrastructure, I mean the book industry that includes publishers, editors, and mechanisms of national, regional, and international literary circulation. I also refer to small scale institutions that provide literary training, facilitate and promote the circulation of literary texts. <laughs> Whoop. When you're, when you're nervous, sometimes you get lost. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay. Sorry, I also refer to smaller scale institutions that provide literary training, facilitate and promote the circulation of literary texts and consecrate literary value, including commercial, non-commercial and academic or state supported cultural projects. Finally, my understanding of literary infrastructure also includes the smallest scale variety, independent presses, literary magazines, literary associations and specialized small book production. Although fragile, these forms of literary infrastructure have sustained the development of Caribbean literatures, just as they have carried many marginal and avant-garde literary movements throughout the world. So this is sort of a little snippet into these kind of two vectors that organize the book that then moves into uh, from this sort of introductory chapter on those ideas on how we might think about infrastructure in relation to the temporality of reading a literary magazine. And then, um, the chapters move to uh, one magazine specific chapter that reevaluates a magazine that has been studied a lot, admittedly, Tropique, produced in, in Martinique by Aimé and Suzanne Césaire, along with René Menil and others. And, um, and then magazines produced in Cuba that were sort of at odds with each other. And I look at what are the sort of post colonial and also. Racial, racial context of writing the Cuban nation at stake in what I read as a magazine battle between these two major magazines in Cuba produced at the same time in 1944. I look at another magazine that has been studied a lot in the Anglophone context, the magazine BIM produced in, in Barbados, but become that became a kind of uh, broader regional in uh, Anglophone West Indian. Uh, magazine, and I look at what are the circumstances that uh, produce its sort of regional outlook, and what are the kind of to what extent we might be able to read a decolonial uh, move, progressive move in uh, BIM. And then I have a chapter where I broadly go back to all of the magazines that I look at and think about how they have sort of remapped the world literary system. And then I have an epilogue where I revisit what's been going on in the book in terms of the writing of pan-Caribbean discourse. And that's, I guess that's sort of the book that I worked on for approximately 11 years. Thank you. Thank you for uh, just situating us. One of the things that I thought was interesting was the way that World War II uh, becomes this sort of anchoring historical context and I wondered if you could say more about or tell us about what your process was for deciding your archive, because you have this historical context around World War II. You have these sort of grounding chapters that take us to the Francophone Caribbean, the Hispanophone Caribbean, the Anglophone Caribbean, um, to these different magazines that are all really around the same time, right? So it's, it's also like the 1940s. And one of the things I thought was interesting was how you describe that, um, you know, as much as there's difference between what's going on politically in these different places, 
that the infrastructure that's available is remarkably similar in the way that it's limited, right? And so I wonder if you could just talk us through the process of maybe deciding on that archive and how the historical moment that you choose to anchor it in of, of World War II and um, the sort of decolonial politics that are happening, how those things sort of coalesced. Yes. Thank you for that. I think that's an, an, a very um, important question for this book. And I think in some ways the, the context of the war was even more central in the writing of my, of my dissertation. And, and it's sort of important in the book. But when I grew the book out, maybe it lost that kind of anchor, which is something that sometime ha sometimes happens. And yet it is this kind of, um, you know, many ways, a look at a very specific moment in the history and genealogy of, of pan-Caribbean discourse and in the production of, of Caribbean literature. So how I come to it, um, how I came to it was that, you know, the question also allows me to get into this sort of process thing that I hope you know, if people are listening and they're in the stages of putting together their dissertation. I wrote a dissertation prospectus. It was defended. It was not the project that I went on to do. Uh, I wrote a prospectus about uh, what, you know, what pan-Caribbean discourse, what meant in um, Caribbean literary history. And I wanted to look at as, as broadly as I could at Caribbean literary history. And I had sort of started with this work on um, Amos Azair's first book publication, which was actually in Cuba in translation in 1943. And I did some work on, on um, the kind of pan-Caribbean work of that translation project. And I was looking for more examples of such things in magazines. And I started with Tropique because there was a sort of response in Tropique um, in which Cesaire also published his translator's work. And um, and other and and respond you know and the magazine group respond to other uh, Cuban writers, and um, as I started to sort of just sort of like go outwards and look at as many magazines as I could look at, I noticed that. For, so I sort of changed my question, and I thought. I got sort of permission from my committee to shift my question a bit and pull out a project on magazines where maybe the original framework would stay or maybe it would leave. And I, I was really frustrated um, one day at the, at the Schomburg Center because I had doing research and looking at lots of magazines um, for you know, several weeks at least at this point over the course of the summer. And I didn't know how I would possibly organize a project on magazines. I was just so overwhelmed by like how much is happening. And I can't tell you like what exactly the moment was, but there was a moment in um, looking at BIM during the 1940s where I saw something that would be unexpected in a magazine that is named for a specific location, right? BIM responds specifically to, um, insular identity in Barbados that was this sort of regional discourse. And I realized that I had seen similar things in Cuban magazines, then um, Gaceta del Caribe that I had been led to um, by scholars in Cuba who I had talked to about my interest in pan-Caribbean discourse. And I sort of, something clicked in a moment in which I was able to understand that for some reason, in the same time period, there was a similar move and it was much more incipient than I expected it to be in the 1940s to posit a regional sense. And it functioning in both similar ways, but also meaning different things in each context and the simultaneity um, suggested to me that it, was, that it was worth looking at these structures kind of more deeply and in relation to each other to kind of figure out something that I hadn't yet uh, been able to read in my studies of Caribbean literature and intellectual history. I don't know if that's, a, that's not a sufficient answer. It does turn out that, that the war um, certainly affects the Caribbean in so many tangible ways, right? So much of the region is occupied, um, has US bases occupied. There's, um, they're also 
impose naval blockades. And because of empire, the, the empires at war with each other meant, right, that people, that the Caribbean being interpolated into these different empires was moved around. Um, this sort of still Eurocentric, in some ways, battle, um, but also in a moment in which the US is vying for a kind of reorganization of its relationship to power in the world and, um, and the US's proximity to the Caribbean and also its history of occupying um, by force different parts of the region. Mm -hmm. you know, it really converged at this time. And there are, I mean, there are others that have made arguments um, that relate to how, you know, but it's very recent. I mean, when I started doing this work, there weren't as many arguments about the 1940s uh, in the Caribbean. And now we're starting, I guess my work was sort of part of, you know, a certain, a certain move towards, towards trying to situate historically and in literary history, the Caribbean during that time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's great because it, it gives us a, a parallel history of right. So yes, you know, we, we understand what's happening with World War II. Um, but as you say, because of empire, it actually just plays out so differently in the Caribbean and, and generates a different kind of response. And so, you know, I thought it was really interesting that the pan-Caribbean moment comes out at this very, you know, comes about in, in different ways at different points in history, but that it has this particular resonance at this period that you're looking at and how that is perhaps um, a result of, or, you know, just influenced by the fact of the war, but that that experience, it's just a different lived experience uh, in the region. Absolutely. So, uh, and I loved the, um, you know, what you said about process. Did that structure then that you have now in the book, was that how different was that from the structure in the dissertation of the dissertation that you actually wrote? So I understand the change from prospectus to what you, as soon as you start researching, the project basically changes, right? Um, how did the structure change from the dissertation to the book? Yes, yes, the structure definitely changed. Mostly, mostly it grew. Um, so I wrote for a dissertation, you know, what might in some ways might seem like lengthwise a short dissertation, but because I was writing through um, a Francophone literary history, a Hispanophone literary history and an Anglophone literary history, um, you know, th there was a density in the project, right? That exceeded length, but it was a three chapter dissertation with an introduction in which I looked just at, um, so I, I focused the, um, I've had a chapter on Tropique that um, it's not the same chapter that I have now, and a chapter on BIM that's not the same chapter that I have now, and the chapter on Gaceta del Caribe um, from the Havana-based uh, Socialist Party-funded literary magazine that, that I sort of write about in dialogue with um, the privately funded Origenes magazine in Cuba for the book. So that that was that's sort of the longest chapter in this book. And um, it was a different chapter in which there was a little inflection on Origenes, but a real focus on sort of writing a literary history of Gaceta del Caribe. Uh, and then the, the final chapter of the book I also added later and some of the kind of grounding conceptual frameworks I also um, added after the dissertation process and based on the postdoctoral research that I did. And, um, and then it bears saying that of course my book also grows or grew in response to a number of factors that um, you know hopefully shape other people's work like responding to my students when I taught Caribbean literature and the kinds of concerns that students had about um, literature. Uh, so my students at Emerson College, uh, where I taught the last six years, highly influenced the shape of my work and also responding to colleagues who read my work and uh, mentors and getting to be on panels and being in those dialogues and sort of listening to other concerns and other approaches, I mean, all of those, everything, everything that I did professionally, you know, shaped the writing of the book. Mm 
So it's interesting to hear that Origenes was not such a big part of the dissertation because it it really um, structures, as you say, you know, that kind of duel <laughs> between the two um, magazines in the Cuba chapter. And this question, I think, applies to the whole book, but particularly that chapter. Um, I thought that there was such an interesting tension throughout the book um, between the literary magazine as a space for formal innovation and the role of these magazines in political activism or consciousness raising. And so I wondered if you could talk about how some of the writers and editors that you discuss grapple with you know, the right to aesthetics, um, the right to a Caribbean literature that is centering formalism, and the interest in promoting or in some cases shunning political issues such as anti-fascism, anti-colonialism, or racism. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm just jotting down notes so I don't forget as I as I go, since it is such a structuring question, not just of that chapter, but of um, of the book. Yeah. So when I was when I was finishing um, my dissertation, I had the great opportunity of talking to one of my, um, one of the people who helped shaped, shape my work, uh, the Cuban uh, poet and, and theorist, Victor Fuller Calzada. And I, you know, I wanna give Victor credit for saying, you've done a great job of responding to the ways that pan-Caribbean discourse comes up in magazines, but what about the magazines that don't do that? And you know, there's also another trend, and um, you know, and I always in putting the three, these three, and not all. Of course, this is not. I, I certainly, you know, it's not a comprehensive look at magazines. It's not a comprehensive look at the region, but in putting the these three different contexts into dialogue, sometimes two contexts dialogue well together. And then the third kind of challenges the framework that you might get comparatively in looking at two contexts. And so in some ways, it was a challenge to my very project to address that tension and to account for the, the push to formalism, um, or the, I'm sorry, the push, you know, the push for more aesthetically grounded and less political magazines that we also see in the Caribbean. And one thing that I came to in the process that comes up in my intro is that I think that, the, that there is a very strong tendency to account for both politics and aesthetics and to be really rigorously accountable to both in Caribbean literary and cultural magazines, perhaps to an extent that exceeds a number of other contexts and it's closest in, in magazines that I've looked at to those of the Harlem Renaissance or to um, others in uh, the post-colonial African context, closer even than some um, you know, South American magazines of the early 20th century and late 19th century that tend to be more formalist than the, the majority of magazines in the Caribbean. And that said, there are still magazines that were responding um, to the right to develop aesthetics without having to account for politics. And yet, in the, to give a sort of, so, so the concrete examples are the, the, the most kind of aesthetically oriented magazines of the four that I primarily focus on. And I bring in others later in the fifth chapter that are also contemporaneous. Um, since I didn't, I did a, a little bit of research, but didn't, didn't have, a, you know, with time constraints, did not write this chapter that I wanted to write about Haitian and Dominican magazines. Um, there, magazines like Origenes and um, and also like BIM, right, tended to prioritize, tended to sort of skirt direct confrontations with political issues. And so in BIM, um, Frank Collymore and his co-editors at different times sort of explicitly said that they were not looking for explicitly political work. And yet we can see some you know, critiques of empire, critiques, very, very scathing critiques of um, the structure of racism in the um, still British colonies in the Caribbean um, in these works that are 
also highly formal sort of aestheticist, you know, modernist literary works. And, um, but I think that in the case of Origenes during the 1940s, I think the aestheticism um, was connected to a kind of a wish to sort of reformulate Cubanness and um, approximate it more strongly to Europe and the US. And I'm very critical of that move and of the some very mostly implicit and sometimes explicit racism in my view of those of those moves of anti-black racism and also anti-asian racism so yeah that's exactly what i was sort of thinking is is kind of you know going on there but and even with the 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 work that you have on tropiques like i i think both emer and suzanne cesar and menil are always kind of hyper conscious of us, I wouldn't say like striking exactly a balance, but attending to both, right? There's the fact that they're political um, doesn't mean that there's, you know, ever a moment where they're ignoring the aesthetic or not innovating in that way or not sort of pushing the envelope in that way. And so it's an interesting kind of contrast. And I would say that even with Origenes, you know, it's not an absence of a political project, but it's a different kind of political project, right? As you say, to align themselves more um, with Spain, with the United States, but, you know, by including writers um, from those parts of the world as well in, in what they were doing. Absolutely. So there's this wonderful dialogue uh, throughout this book between and in the magazines, it seems between Caribbean literary criticism and Caribbean literature. And it reminded me that as scholars, we talk a lot about the history of Caribbean literature and maybe not as much or not enough about the history of Caribbean literary criticism, right? Coming out of the region. And so I wondered how do these magazines, Tropiques, Origenes, Caseta del Caribe, and BIM, how do they help us situate a history of Caribbean literary criticism and Caribbean literary theory? Yes, th thank you so much for, for asking that. I mean, I, I definitely think that as, as I got to the later stages of completing this book, that the question of sort of how does this book contribute to, um, you know, the possibility for really thinking about how, about a history of Caribbean literary theory in particular works. And um, the, it's, yes, there is definitely a dialogue. So, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to draw attention to in my writing about Tropiques is that Tropique was highly engaged in the process of you know, producing a located literary theory in addition, to, right, to actually um, like responding to a socio-political moment and, and that it is through that located literary theory that they are contributing Right, to the black consciousness movement that they're also known for um, through the uh, Negritude movement and through the sort of, right, the reformula, a, a reformula, a, a reformulation, excuse me, a reformulation of uh, black identity, of race pride in, in a context that, um, you know, through the rise of fascism and uh, the the situation of the Vichy regime, it appeared that there might have been a heightening of uh, of tension and awareness of how some forms of uh, French anti-blackness uh, were at work, um, and and so that that sort of literary theoretical work, some of it they dialogue with other contexts and. Um, there's a dialogue with kind of some literary theoretical work that in in the Cuban magazines that I look at in Gaceta del Caribe and in Origenes are two kind of opposing theoretical paradigms that in some ways Tropique resolves in some ways and um, in, in, in sort of my reading and, and I sort of maybe I don't say this exactly in, in the book but I kind of gesture to this in the in the last chapter of the book that um, 
Gaceta del Caribe is vying for a kind of social realism, a kind of uh, a positing of sort of literature in the service, right, in the service of revolution, in the service of uh, transformation, and um, you know, are positing, are sort of aligning themselves with, um, in some ways, some you know dogmatic views that are. Um, that are relevant in this period and the period before also in Europe in relation to the Communist Party. And at the, you know, at the same time, there seems to be a pressure that, um, that other magazine projects in Cuba have also responded to, which is not to explicitly make uh, race-based moves, but to implicitly right, draw attention to the history of Black literature in Cuba through the kind of organization of the magazine and to in kind of interrupt structures of Eurocentrism. And, um, and then in Origenes, there's, it's a very clear influence of um, new criticism that, um, you know, that is coming up in the United States in this period and that is vying for and as, you know, in its most idealized take, right, literature as a place of, um, of freedom from the constraints of political life, from totalitarianism of, of different kinds, right? But then in its worst case scenario is objecting to the presence of all social factors in literary production, which means objecting right, to racialized forms of engaging in literature, gendered forms of engaging in literature. And I think, you know, there are very, there are reasons to be very critical of those, of those moves as well. Um, so th these are, I mean, I think that some of these are not the only debates on the table at this time. I think the magazines also allow us to do things that, um, that I that maybe I haven't done as much explicitly, but also allow us to recuperate, um, you know, forms of interaction, gendered forms of interaction that we might not see possible because of the ways that other structures of literary criticism have kind of invisibilized or um, downplayed the role of women in such literary movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm curious. I, I want. Tell us more <laughs> about the gendered politics of these magazines. Yeah, so I think that All right, so one of the things that I've that I came across a couple of times in research um, is that, that there are these sort of posterior literary critical works that will recuperate um, men in these movements and not recuperate the women that are there. And so I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to call anybody out specifically, but um, I'm, you know, I'm sure that you're very well aware, um, given the structure of your work uh, that has, you know, invited us to rethink the, um, the perspective of women in a political context in Grenada that, uh, very often leaves women out, right? Um, but I, the, it's hard to sort of access like the exact dynamics, right? Like I don't have the, all of the letters that say these are the exact things that were happening in this context. Mm -hmm. um, but it is very clear that, so one of the, so in the context of Tropic, I, I keep returning to it, in part because Suzanne Césaire is more and more sort of being seen as getting more credit for the kind of influence that she exercised in this context. And so one of the things that I try to draw out is how she is in clear dialogue with Aimé Césaire and René Menil, and that you can pull out their conversations and the ways that they are implicitly citing each other and responding to each other and building together theoretically, and that there's this kind of collective there. In um, the context of Gaceta del Caribe, the editorial board member who, um, there's one woman on the editorial board of Gaceta del Caribe, uh, Mirta Aguirre, and there are statements that the editorial board writes together without authorship. And of course she contributes regularly to the magazine and a few other women do. 
but you get you do get this sense from the, their letters that there's this kind of collective and that it's you know that there's there are more men and there's one woman and you don't you don't know everything that's going on but that they're functioning in a collective and that she's part of this collective and part of this project and um uh and in the context of bim there are well and there are also a number of women writers of course and and actually a surprisingly large amount of women writers who contribute to Orihenes. Orihenes does deserve credit, I think, for um, for that. Although there are there is one woman kind of in this like larger group, but not on the editorial board of Orihenes. In BIM, there is no woman on the editorial board itself, but there are these regular mentions to this woman, uh, Jan Williams, who we don't you know who um, I think there's you know, more recovery work potentially to be done around her, um, who Kali Moore as editor refers to supporting the process. And I sort of trace the way that the presence of one of her works seems to shift the magazine. It seems to have, there's something in her critique, right, that uh, is both anti-colonial and anti-sexist that seems to sort of make a mark on um, BIM. But there are a number of women writers in BIM, some of whom, uh, including uh, Collymore's own wife who contributed pseudonymously. Um, and there are, I mean, there's definitely a lot of recovery work to be done with so many women who contributed to BIM. So that's not a sufficient answer. I look forward to people who, who'd answer it better in the future. Well, one of the questions I had is, because um, you mentioned the dialogue between BIM and Caribbean voices. So does Una Marson's time overlap as well because no she's before it's, it's swansea by that time yeah okay yes it's swansea by the time that that connection gets made but i think that caribbean voices under una marson is being is still broadcast and still influencing the context right because of the ways that caribbean voices was broadcast locally in the caribbean okay Great. So I want to remind everyone that you are free to raise your hand if you want to ask a question. This is a great time for us to bring in any audience questions or use the question and answer. Okay, so uh, Renee has raised a hand. So Renee, I'm going to allow you to speak now. Go ahead. Hello, right. can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Katarina for this presentation. I have so many questions, uh, but for now, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the language question. So I was wondering, how do the imagination and infra infrastructure of a pan-Caribbean public sphere come up against language barriers, creoles, or a relatively minor colonial language such as Dutch? And what is the role of translation in the magazines that you examine? Um, yeah, hoping to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much. Okay, yes, of course, language is an extraordinary and important question. And um, let's see. So how do we how do we talk about the language question best? In um, I think that the sort of the best way that you know in in a number of these contexts. Um, and I do sort of situate the book by saying that I'm working in um, on writing in Spanish, English, and French, and other creolized forms, and that certainly um, there's a there's definitely a drive to orality, and especially especially in fictional works and in the publication of folklore in some contexts. And so, uh, in the texts that are moving away from a kind of third person narrative that um, is uh, sort of seeking to standardize in some form the language and instead try to get at the way that people in various contexts actually speak to each other. Um, you know, there are all kinds of linguistic registers throughout the magazines. How the language question relates to pan-Caribbean discourse is, um, is also potentially a very helpful question for the, the work of, of pan-Caribbean discourse in this moment. So I think, I think it's worth saying that in some ways this moment isn't 
you know, it's, it's very recent that we'll, we think about this moment in relation to a kind of sense of, of the pan-Caribbean. And I think it's important to point this out that I, it, uh, early in my stage in my project, I asked, um, I had the, the great opportunity to get to speak um, directly with George Lamming about, about um, his memories of BIM and what he thought about it. And I suggested to him that I was writing about pan, a pan-Caribbean moment in the 1940s. And he shook his head and he said, no way. There was no pan-Caribbean moment in the 1940s. We didn't meet each other until the 60s. And so, um, of course, now I've turned to the 60s to all of those meetings because they are quite fascinating and it's a different kind of moment. But, um, but what I am suggesting is not, is that there wasn't an achievement of uh, pan-Caribbean discourse as much as that there was this sense and that there were some, um, you know, important writers who, who also worked on magazines like M. Césaire, like Nicolas Guillén, like Alejo Carpentier, uh, like George Lamming, who had the opportunity to move in the region and that in the moving, they saw things that they might not have seen if they had not moved. And that sometimes that's not necessarily a linguistic translation. So that for Lamming going to work in Trinidad allowed him to think comparatively about Trinidad and Barbados um, in a way that, that potentially allowed him to posit a kind of a pan-Caribbean articulation of this that, that, I, that I write about in the chapter on BIM and his first um, short story where he, you know, calls someone the West Indian and is doing some very specific work about what that means, um, what it means for someone to be the West Indian in this context that relates to the stuff that he writes about later, about what West Indian con you know, consciousness might be in relation to a colonial paradigm. And, um, but similarly, there's a moment in my introduction where I go to this 1945 letter of Emma Césaire's that um, in which he's responding to having been to Haiti and he hadn't yet been to Cuba. He doesn't go until 1968, but going to Haiti similarly um, and finding a lot of cultural proximity, but still some distance from Martinique allows him to start imagining about the, the rest of the region in a similar way that Suzanne Césaire does in her extraordinary essay, uh, Le Grand Camouflage, where she's also, she's thinking about Puerto Rico um, even though she hasn't been there because of her time in Haiti. Um, so there's, there's less translating than I wanted to see in these particular magazines. I think there are other magazines that are doing this work that I found out about late in the game that have more translating. It isn't until, um, I think it's 1950 that the first translated works from French are published in BIM. I don't see translations from the Anglophone Caribbean in um, the Cuban magazines that I'm looking at in the 40s, but, but yes, from, um, from French, uh, Jacques Humain and Mes Césaire um, are translated. And, and then you see a little bit, some work, especially from Cuba, some work from Venezuela are translated into Tropique. So that's fascinating because I think in, I don't know if it's in the chapter or in one of your footnotes, Lamming writes the letter back to Colin Morneau saying that he's in Trinidad and it's uh, that basically there's, they are enacting federation through the writing. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. And I had, yeah, and I had to get permission from both Lamming and Colin Moore's estate um, to, to see that, that exchange of letters, but Yes, I mean, Lamming is really excited in this 1948 moment where he really, he, you know, he's seeing a kind of literary, um, yeah, a literary region, right? Mm -hmm. A literary West Indies in mm -hmm. BIM that is kind of being achieved at this time that there are all of these different political possibilities for what the West Indies Federation may or may not become that are being gestated in politics and that in you know in dialogue with those there is this literary kind of drive it it appears to want to to sort of do this local writing but also to be thinking about the region through the local and to what extent you know this you know this west indianness might be relevant from um 
that I mean, so that work kind of happens by like choosing not to name certain locations, right? And to sort of just write into a very located space without naming it, that then could resonate more broadly in the readership to other parts of the region. So while we wait to see if there are any other audience questions, I want to ask you a related question. It is about cartography because um, you do this great work with mapping. So not only in this chapter on polycentric maps and literary world making, but throughout the book, you're really drawing our attention to um, what you call the locus of enunciation. And I wondered like how you became, I guess I should combine this question, how you became interested in the sort of cartographic aspect of Caribbean literature, right? And, and why is it important for us to think about the literature in this way? And I suppose that's connected in some ways to genre and what you mentioned about um, like the West Indian local as a genre. I thought that that was fascinating. You know, the other question I had was about how these magazines change how you think about genre, but maybe let's hold off on that and just deal with the um, cartography aspect of thinking Caribbean literature and cartography together. Yeah, thank you. I mean, um, I think the, the cartography came up question came up in a, in a few different ways. Um, I started thinking when I thought about rewriting the introduction to my book to focus more explicitly on pan-Caribbean discourse and, and how it worked, I started thinking, okay, well, can I say that like these, that the magazine work is necessarily decolonial. And so can I just sort of like posit this and can I posit this then? And there have been other works that have sort of suggested, you know, the Eurocentric project of coloniality is related to the map. And you see this like um, in kind of clear ways and important ways when, for example, the Caribbean Philosophical Association talks about uh, shifting the cartography of reason, right? And, um, and so I thought, okay, so, but what is this sort of, can I kind of just boldly go out and say like maps are here and the opposite of the map <laughs> is the literary magazine. And then like, as you know, as it were, <laughs> uh, I started looking more into maps and, and, and started to remember that it's hard to totalize mediums and that I'm not so sure I can totalize with mediums. And that, and as I looked more closely at some um, you know, really good recent work on literary magazines, I saw, oh, over and over again, everyone's talking actually about a cartographic function. Like it's just happening in the criticism. And um, I'm not, and so it started to, I started to kind of want to shift that, that totalizing conception and instead suggest, I'm not sure, like maybe this, um, maybe there are modes sometimes where like the capturing work of the map is being reformulated in a magazine, but maybe we can also think about some productive ways that, that the magazines are asking us, you know, to reformulate the cartography of literature or the way that we imagine the world literary system and are telling us they have their own world that isn't the, you know, that they, they have, um, they have resituated their kind of transnational flows, attentions and priorities, right? That, that, that they're not the same ones that, that would be articulated from a Eurocentric project from Europe or somewhere else. Um, and, and then the locus of enunciation sort of work um, seemed really helpful for asking the question, you know, what does it mean to do, to do a pan-Caribbean discourse? And sort of what is it as a discourse? And, um, and then it, yes, it's certainly a gestation of the history of, uh, of post-colonial critique, um, but it's also a response to numerous paradigms for that sort of remind us um, of the importance of, of location in, in the production of knowledge. And then of course, one that, that, that nece necessarily asked me to regularly think about my own location in relation to this work. And that I know that I name at, at one point in the introduction, but that in, you know, if I had continued to write the project without overtaking the project would certainly have written in 
more and, and look forward to doing in the future. So I wondered uh, just if there's any other questions, please raise your hand or, um, but while people are formulating, how does this question of location then translate to an audience? Because you write about the ways in which these magazines, you know, imagine a particular kind of audience, but then also the way in which the, the audience that's actually responding is shaping the magazine in different ways. And there's a kind of um, exchange there. So I wondered if you could, you know, as much as we've, we're situating the writers um, as you do so well, what's happening on the audience side of it in terms of the readership? Yes, that's that's excellent. Thank you so much for all of your very generous and extraordinary questions, Lori. I um, so so one of one of the questions of audience that um, that maybe sometimes we forget is that writers are also the audience for other writers. Sometimes in a literary magazine, the kind of community, the building a community of, of writers around the writing is, um, is necessarily something that occurs. There's, uh, there's a challenge to tracking audiences. There was, um, in, there was something really helpful that Frank Collymore had in his archive, which was a record of subscriptions to BIM. And um, and so there you could see that the the magazine like that it was moving through several islands that it moved to the UK that uh, West Indian writers living in London were receiving um, BIM in the mail right in London and in other parts of England, um, but that there were also sometimes I mean there's also another kind of infrastructure that I engage less that um, some people have been writing about productively, which is the way the magazines engage with newspapers and the way that the newspaper reviews would sometimes become an audience. And, um, and there were, there are references to readership that that come up so that sometimes magazines shape themselves in relation to having established networks in different places. And sometimes they're responding to critiques from newspapers or, um, and it's hard to know, I mean, if there is, it's hard to know kind of how widespread each audience is. And, um, but there is definitely a sense that there is a local audience imagined and that, um, and that the magazine project facilitates that possibility of circulating locally. And that I think that, that that's important because there's often um, a kind of taking for granted that if London, Paris or Madrid is publishing um, or New York, right, is publishing a work of Caribbean literature that the Caribbean is not, the you know, Caribbean peoples are not necessarily the audience, even though of course the Caribbean is also in London, Madrid, New York mm -hmm. and, um, and Paris. And so um, in, in diaspora, um, so that I guess that's the part that's important to say that yeah. the presumption and at least a wish for being read locally is there. Yeah, and I, I love that point you make about the writers also being the audience, which I think is important. So two questions in the from the Q and A. Uh, one is from Douglas. Since one endeavor of this book is to historicize the infrastructure of Caribbean literary criticism, and because the project involves such expertise in the multilingualism of the region, yes, very impressive, uh, a lot of translation work that you're doing yourself here in this text. Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on the contemporary infrastructure of literary criticism, namely the shrinking of US comparative literature or other spaces in which one is not beholden to a single language or nation. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Douglas, um, and for being here. And um, hmm, the contemporary infrastructure of literary criticism. Perhaps sometimes one of the downsides of sort of digging deep 
historically into a context is there are certain ways in which one should always be thinking about the present and some ways in which one is so immersed that, that one is less thinking about how that particular phenomenon works in the present. But I think that what I'll draw attention to that isn't exactly, exactly what you're asking is that there are definitely resonances with contemporary contexts of the infrastructural marginalization or withholding of resources in literary production that I think that we need to um, be sort of very cognizant of, right? The ways that potentially more and more um, large publishing companies are growing larger, right? And um, are even more kind of centralized and um, they sort of buy up small presses, right? And there's a centralization and um, that we wanna pay attention in different contexts to sort of who is and who isn't being published and what are the circumstances that makes one um, publishable in this, you know, in those contexts and what are the ways that we might um, on, uh, at the same time, there is, a, you know, this democratization of, of uh, online space that allows independent projects to flourish, but they move through specific channels. And um, yeah, I mean, shoot, what is the contemporary infrastructure of literary criticism? Um, not being beholden to a single language or nation. I, I mean, these are really important questions. I think I'm answering them insufficiently, but it's what I've got. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the next question, can Katarina talk more about the infrastructure or infrastructures forming during this time in the Caribbean? Can you tell us more about the archival work in multiple places and languages? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so that's that question of infrastructure in the Caribbean broadly, and sort of including but beyond um, publishing infrastructure is certainly um, really important and was has been sort of centrally on my mind as I wrote this book while different Caribbean infrastructures were faced with um, with earthquakes and um, hurricanes and we saw what seemed like these kinds of natural disasters but of course as a number of critics have told us right are also disasters that are made all the more um, intensified by the imperial structures that have to, you know, to refer to Walter Rodney, Rodney underdeveloped infrastructural space in, um, in the Caribbean. So the, that meant that, in, and for lots of reasons, some of the archives therefore are not located in the Caribbean. So that I've, I did archival work in Miami, um, at the Cuban Heritage Collection, although I also did do some archival work um, in, in Cuba, um, at the National Library, at um, Casa de las Americas, but a very minimal amount, much more at the Cuban Heritage Collection, in the Cuba context. But then the magazines themselves also function as the archives in some ways that bring up all of these different kinds of uh, references to sort of to research and uh, I've also researched them at many universities around the US. I, I did do research at the National Library, sorry, at the National Archive in Barbados uh, for this a very important correspondence to the, the work that I did on, on BIM between Lamming and Collymore. Did research in, um, in Paris um, where there are holdings of Emma Césaire and Suzanne Césaire's um, letters, um, also in the Wifredo Lam archive in, in Paris, where there's some also really sort of extraordinary exchanges between um, uh, Wifredo Lam, the uh, painter, and Emma Césaire. Um, I've done some work at the um, in London, um, also some archival research the George Padmore Institute is an extraordinary uh, collection with holdings relating to the Caribbean arts movement. Um, but um, a lot of the things that I've researched have been also a lot of different uh, periodical publications around, around the US. That's great. Thank you so much. So we are out of time. What I am going to do is just 
allow folks to talk so that we can have just a round of applause and um, cheers for Katerina. So I'm just uh, like unmuting our participants here. But thank you so much, Katerina, for this wonderful presentation. Hello. Thank you. Yay. And again, here's the book, Writing the Caribbean and Magazine Time, available from Rutgers University Press. So please go out there, get it, um, read it, use it in your classrooms. And for those of you interested in more um, activities and programs from Oswald, please visit us online at oswalddiaspora.org. Otherwise, thank you for being with us and take care everybody and stay safe. And maybe I'll just stay on for another second or two more because Katharina, there are some nice messages coming up for you. Thank uh, you. From some of your friends who are here. Yes, thank you to everyone who's here, people I admire very much and um, I appreciate your presence. Thank you. Right. Great. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.